Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the aquarium. I'm Jerry Schubel, president of the aquarium. It's good to see all of you who are here in person, and we welcome all of you who are watching remotely. I would request that you turn your cell phones off or at least put them on vibrate and refrain from texting for the next hour. I want to acknowledge our lecture sponsors, <coughs> excuse me, Gazette Newspapers and Courtyard Marriott. Tonight, I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Tapan Patak, who's going to discuss, discuss the impacts of climate change on California's agricultural industry. He's already been very helpful to us in shaping the story for our expansion, Pacific Visions, and he's going to continue the discussion this evening. He serves as a Cooperative Extension Specialist in Climate Adaptation for Agriculture at the University of California Division of Agriculture and Resources, and he's located at UC Merced. He led a team of researchers recently and published a very important paper on this issue in a journal called Agronomy last February, and that's where we first got to know him through that paper. His background and experience and expertise are in applied climate science in agriculture, crop modeling applications, and agricultural adaptation research. He's actively engaged in various state and regional research and extension efforts addressing climate resilience in agriculture. Prior to joining the University of California in 2015, he served on the extension faculty at the University of Nebraska, again with a focus on applications of, of how climate uh, will affect agriculture. He grew up in India, got his bachelor's degree there, came to the United States, got a, his uh, master's degree from Utah State University, and received his PhD from the University of Florida. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Tapan Patak. Good evening, everyone. Uh, uh, thanks, for, thanks for inviting me. Uh, I'm really uh, excited and, and honored to be here. Um, and I wanted to thank Jerry for giving me this opportunity to talk, talk about the issues of climate change in agriculture in California. And I also wanted to congratulate Jerry and his team for doing an excellent, outstanding job with public engagement and education on, not just on this topic, but you know, how we envision water, food, energy, and how they all systems are integrated. And, and uh, I learned a few things about Pacific Vision. And so thanks for uh, you know, allowing me to contribute to that Pacific Vision. So thank you. Um, today, <clears throat> I'm going to talk very broadly and, and uh, at the sort of the state scale is, is what types of changes that we have already experienced in California and uh, what are the expected changes in the future and how it is going to impact uh, our agricultural industry. So this is just an outline for, for this talk is uh, first I'm going to uh, mention about important facts for California's agriculture. Um, then move into a few climate basics terminologies and differentiation between those terminologies and, and how, how those uh, changes or how those terminologies uh, are, are used in climate science. And uh, then I'll talk about both observed and projected changes in temperature, precipitation, extreme events uh, that includes extreme heat, drought, uh, flood, et cetera, and uh, reduced snowpack as an impact of climate change. Um, when you think about agricultural impacts, yield declines, ch uh, less chill hour accumulations, growing season shifts, uh, pest and disease pressure, et cetera, and um, then summary and, and uh, key recommendations for the future research. So here are very impressive facts about California, we are number one agricultural state in the country, um, and uh, our industry is almost $46 billion. So we have 76,400 farms. This is from 2016-2017 CDFA report, and so these numbers do change quite a bit. Um, and then we have almost 400 plus commodities in California. So we have this uh, Mediterranean climate, which uh, which is very unique, 
um, in in United States, and and so that allows uh, us to grow more more uh, crops and commodities in California, and so uh, farm gate value uh, forty six billion dollars. We are number one state there. Um, out of hundred million acres of total land, uh, agriculture share is about 40, 43 million. Uh, and out of those 43 million, 16 million is grazing land, and uh, 27 million acre is a cropland. So, and, and out of those uh, cropland of 27 million, only 9 million acre is irrigated. So, less than 10% less than is irrigated, and we are still producing um, highest amount of food in, 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 in California. So, that's really impressive. Uh, we are leading state in the dairy production. Two thirds of uh, fruits and nut production is uh, grown in California. One third of vegetable production is here. So, and when we think about uh, top ten most valued commodities, dairy is number one with a six point zero seven billion dollar industry, followed by grapes at five point five, almonds five point one, cattle cows two point five, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so. Um, many of those crops are, are called specialty crops in California, and then um, there is a big industry for specialty crops. So uh, if you compare a couple of years ago, hay production was among the top 10 commodities, which was uh, taken over by oranges. So uh, they do fluctuate uh, year to year. So <clears throat> let's talk about basics um, and try to distinguish climate variability and climate change. So there are two figures. Uh, the top one is called multivariate ENSO index. ENSO is El Nino Southern Oscillation. Uh, this is one of many indices that define El Nino Southern Oscillation. And, and so uh, multivariate ENSO index is, um, is one of the, the popular ones which is used. And uh, the bottom one says pa Pacific Decadal Oscillation. So both of those indices um, have blue and orange color. Uh, orange is when the sea surface temperature is above normal, uh, and, and the blue is uh, sea surface temperature is below normal. And uh, based on their index values, when, when in, in terms of El Nino, when they are above normal for a certain time frame, that phase is defined as El Nino. And when it's cooler than normal, the phase is called La Nina. And, uh, and when you look at the time frame, multivariate ENSO index variation is, is shorter in time frame, so six months to about 18 months, whereas the Pacific Decadal Oscillation is a decade up to two decades. And so this is just an example of a couple of uh, large-scale teleconnection patterns, and they do influence climate quite a bit across the globe. So, and that is defined under climate variability. So the climate variability by definition is a measure of short-term climate fluctuations above or below their long-term average. And so long-term average is typical 30 years uh, period. As opposed to that, when we think about climate change, climate change is a gradual, statistically significant change. So that change can be increasing or decreasing depending on which variable we are studying. And so just to give you an example of how the short-term climate variability do influence climate, um, the, the top figure is for El Nino during the winter time, December through February. And, uh, if you, and this is a very coarse reality. And so this is kind of uh, the, the global scale picture. And so there are, uh, there can, there are certain uh, uncertainty uh, in, embedded into this uh, uh, the schematic, but but in general, when you have El Nino, northwestern edge of United States is expected to be warmer than normal, uh, whereas the southern part of uh, U.S. Uh, is expected to be cooler than normal. And um, if uh, it's similar for uh, parts of India and Asia in general, 
uh, warmer conditions, whereas in Africa it's, it's much drier and warmer conditions is expected. And there are patches in, in, in South America where you can have cooler and wet conditions or dry conditions. So depending on, depending on your location, those, uh, uh, during the El Nino years, you do see those influence. Um, uh, the bottom one is El Nino during the summertime. And if you see the United States, uh, there is clearly no connection. So, but um, parts of uh, uh, South America and, and, and even in Australia and other regions, they do see those uh, teleconnections. During the La Nina, and if you focus on US for the winter time, the, the trend has almost flipped uh, this area is expected to be cooler than normal, whereas the southern part is drier than normal. Well, if we think about California, uh, even in the strongest El Nino years, um, there are certain years where we have drier than normal years, and there are certain years where much wetter than normal. So there is inherent uncertainty, and, and there is many times those teleconnections have interactions among themselves, and so that's hard to, to understand, but um, uh, in, in California, uh, there is a lot of uncertainty of finding El Nino connections. Um, and uh, speaking of that, this is the, the newest model which uh, tells us that we are expected to be um, in the El Nino phase uh, in, the win in the fall time. So there are, there's almost 70% uh, likelihood that we are going to be in El Nino coming, coming fall. And, and so you know, these are ensembles of different models, but all of them are, are above this line mostly. And, and more specifically, if it is above the 0 0.5 range, uh, that sort of tells us that we are going to be in El Nino year. Okay, so this is um, five years running average of temperatures across the globe. Uh, and on the top right, there is a year uh, which is flipping from 1930 and, and onwards, and so earlier 90s. And all the blue is cooler than normal conditions, and orange is warmer than normal conditions. So since 1970 onwards, every single year has been warmer than normal. And this is the latest. 2013 to 2017 composite, every part of the globe is under warmer than normal conditions. Uh, there is uh, one point I want to make is, is, you know, you see significantly warmer than normal conditions compared to this part. That doesn't mean that they experienced more temperature increases and uh, compared to, so this is warmer and this is cooler. That's not like that. This is more specific to their normal conditions. So it's not the, the actual numbers, but it's a deviation from their normal conditions. And, and this is normally ranges uh, negative two degrees to positive two degrees centigrade. So this is at the global scale. At the same time, we do see year-to-year -year variations. So the top figure is March of 2018. And uh, that tells us, so if you, if you see United States there, um, we were either near normal or even cooler than normal for uh, March of 2018. But if you see the global average, March was among the, the warmest March on record. Um, so it was, I think, probably sixth or seventh on record. Whereas the, the bottom figure is May of 2018. And uh, US uh, was among the warmest May on record. So within two months, there, we have this uh, fluctuations in temperatures. Um, and so this is year-to-year -year variation. I just wanted to make this point. So if we focus on California, um, this figure shows last 100 years 
of rate of change in the temperatures. Um, so, this is observed changes and you see uh, this two figures. So, this one on the left is uh, rate of maximum temperature increases and on the right is minimum temperature. If you focus on San Joaquin Valley, which is this region where a lot of uh, ag agricultural production is in California, maximum temperature is only increased at the rate of 0 0.02 degrees centigrade per decade, whereas minimum temperature is 0 0.17 degrees centigrade per decade. So there is a substantial increase in the minimum temperature. And this trend is um, almost similar across California. So if you compare, and, and another point is this number is not even statistically significant. If you focus on uh, uh, Sierra region, maximum temperature is even declining. So there is not an increasing trend, but there is a declining trend. But there is a significant increase in the minimum temperatures, and that's how it impacting uh, Sierra snow melt and uh, reduced snowpack, etc. And so the minimum temperature increases are are crucial for agricultural impacts. And this is another way of looking at the same scale or the historical temperature records. This is a, uh, this is the zero line is is sort of the baseline, and anything departing from that baseline is departure from normal. So, orange is the maximum temperature, green is the minimum temperature. So, for all all these different zones, um, minimum temperature only departed uh, either one to two degrees the maximum temperature, but the minimum temperature. Um, departed almost one to four degrees uh, Fahrenheit compared to their normal conditions. And so this is from the uh, recent California Department of Water Resources report. When we think about precipitation, uh, this figure shows time series of three uh, locations in California, two in Northern California, one in Southern. And, uh, has both observed temperature records as well as projections of the future under both low and high emission scenario. As you can see, there is clearly no trend. It's almost a flat line, but you see a lot of variability. And so that do tell us that we are going to be vulnerable to both flood conditions as well as drought conditions in California. So um, even though we don't see any uh, drier or wetter trend in California um, for these locations or, or generally in California, uh, this variability is, is, is going to be uh, an issue that we need to be worried about. Um, this is U.S. average, um, not California specific, but it tells extreme single day precipitation event uh, in the historical record. So, if you look at the recent years, extreme single day precipitation event has been uh, occurring more often in the recent years. So, eight out of 10 extreme single day precipitation event has been occurring since 1990. And so, th uh, again, this is a US average, not California. But um, in California, we do get our uh, rain in a um, uh, few atmospheric river storms which brings a lot of moisture um, to California. And so there is a projection that even if, even if we see a declining in number of storms coming, but each storm will be uh, more intense in the future. So that, that brings us more vulnerable to drought conditions if we can't capture that water. Um, this is both composite of uh, temperature and precipitation records uh, categorized into dry, hot, wet, hot, dry, cold, and wet, cold conditions. So anything above this line is hotter than normal, uh, and below this line is, is cooler than normal. <coughs> Excuse me. 
if you focus on uh, recent years, so 2000 to 2014, last 15 years, every single year has been about this line, which is, which every single year is, is harder than normal. But more specifically, out of those 15 years, nine years are in this category, dry and hot. Um, we did experience uh, exceptional drought in California, and, and um, you see a lot of red dots that, that are part of that exceptional drought that we have. Um, so, so we are going to see those extremes in the future, and, and less in this category. So, um, number of extreme heat days. So, extreme heat days are, are defined as uh, when you take an average, let's say 30 years. So, the, the, the extreme heat days are, or the thresholds are defined as 98th percentile of the, so the very end tail of their, their average for that time frame. And so, this is just an example for Merced, California, which is uh, uh, central U.S., uh, central California, central valley. Um, and based on 1960 to 1990 records, average number of days exceeding 104 degrees were about four days. So in the future, 2070 to 2099, we are going to see 40 days with temperature exceeding this range. And again, this number or this threshold is, is different. So if we, if we go in an Imperial Valley region, um, this threshold would be 120 or so uh, compared to here. And, and in Long Beach, it might be lower than 104 degrees as a threshold. Uh, but if you look at the trend in the future, uh, there is clearly upward trend with a with lot of variations. <clears throat> and not only that, uh, so not only the number of days are, are expanding, but the time of extreme heat days. Uh, so it's important. So <clears throat> every single dot corresponds to those extreme heat days. Uh, and so in the historical context, most of those extreme heat days where uh, during the summertime, so June through August. If you move into the future, you see denser conditions. So uh, the days with 108 to 170, you see more and more yellow in this category. Not only that, the, those dates or those dots are expanding from May all the way through October. So, so that tells us um, many things. So one is impacting on agricultural production as extreme heat days are, are going to be uh, really impactful for agricultural production, but also uh, agricultural workers. Uh, so their health conditions, their productivity, all those conditions are, are also going to be the problem with, with this kind of trend. <clears throat> and this is a heat wave indicator for California in general for both daytime heat wave index and nighttime. Um, most of the daytime index for many regions is, is kind of uh, sitting flat, uh, whereas the coastal area is seeing those oscillation and a little bit upward trend. But almost all this region is, is seeing <clears throat> more nighttime heat waves. Um, and so Every single region in California is, is kind of picking up the support trend based on the historical records. This is a, one of those drought indices. Uh, this is called Palmer Drought Severity Index. Um, this tells the relative dryness. Uh, and so this is one of the, the, the popular indices that's used across the United States for, for drought conditions. And uh, in this figure, it shows average drought conditions across the United States. Although there is a lot of fluctuation, there is no trend in, in this category. But when we <clears throat> look at the, the southwestern United States, you start seeing this <clears throat> declining trend here. And 
if you see below two uh, or four, that's a severe drought condition. So uh, we are kind of uh, seeing this downward trend, uh, and this is for uh, southwestern U.S. And this is a drought monitor uh, map for California. This is the recent one, and as you can see, there is no uh, dark red, uh, which is exceptional drought. Uh, so that doesn't show in this figure, and, and that means in, in the current conditions in California, we are not seeing this drought. However, when we think about agriculture, uh, this drought indicator um, mean doesn't mean a lot of things. Because um, you know, if if they have water regulations, irrespective of the drought, agricultural drought would be far different than than the the drought indicator mentions. Uh, this figure shows the historic uh, the last uh, six seven years of drought that we have. So starting from 2013 all the way, um, as you can see almost at one point, almost 50% of the state was in the exceptional drought condition. So this is just the time series of uh, and the, the area by different drought categories in California. This is a um, snowpack conditions in the historical context. And uh, the bigger the dot is, it tells us the higher reduce amount of reduced snowpack. So most of the Sierra uh, did experience uh, reduced snowpack uh, in the historical context and also part of Oregon and Nevada region too <clears throat> and uh, also the Colorado River Basin here. Um, and, and, and this is again in the, the historical context and, and uh, there are places where you have almost 60 to 80 percent reduction in the snowpack. If we think about the future, and this is a historical range 1960 to 1990, um, under low emission scenario, we are projected to see 48 percent reduction in the snowpack. And the snowpack is our natural water storage, and so um, this reduction would be substantial for California. And, and under the higher emission scenario, that number could be 65 percent. So there was a recent report by UCLA. Um, they studied temperature increases, and then what they found was uh, this temperature in Sierra Nevada region could be increased by seven to ten percent, uh, seven to ten degrees Fahrenheit uh, in the future, <clears throat> which was uh, more than previously uh, projected, and so th that can have also the negative consequences on the the snowpack. Okay, so let's talk about we, what we uh, saw so far was uh, the trends in the climate um, and a few impacts on the snowpack. Um, how does all this relate to agriculture? So as Jerry was mentioning, we recently published a paper. Sorry to brag about my own paper here, but um, I just wanted to acknowledge all my co-authors, um, and, and so they all contributed to this paper. Um, we, we distilled information from almost 90 different papers and, and, uh, and reported the facts that there were published in a credible um, uh, sources such as government reports, university reports, and, and uh, highly cited papers. And so uh, this is a freely accessible uh, paper, so if you want to get this for the reference, feel free to download it from the website. Um, when we think about impacts, as we know, California, we have so many microclimate conditions. So when we think about climate impacts, uh, impacts due to temperature, impacts due to heat waves, they do vary region to region, and they do vary with respect to different crops and commodities, right? This is just a simple summary from National Climate Assessment Report. Um, what they, they reported is, is um, a major climate indicator impacting different crops and commodities, so the, in, in terms of the sensitivity of the crops. So when we think about vegetables, uh, their exposure to temperature in the range of 1.8 degree to 7.2 degrees Fahrenheit, 
above their optimum range. Uh, so every every vegetable crop or every crop has their optimum temperature range in which they grow perfectly. And so if it, the temperature ranges are above that range, that impacts their yield. But when those temperature exceeds 9 to 12 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, you see a substantial decline in, in their production. We have um, so many uh, fruits and nuts in California, and, and those perennial crops Many of them do require a certain amount of chill accumulation during the winter dormancy period. Um, and, and so because of this um, increase in the minimum temperatures, chill accumulations are declining significantly. And that is impacting uh, perennial crops in California. And so that do impact yield. Uh, for crops like soybean and alfalfa, elevated CO2 has been linked with uh, uh, reduced nitrogen and protein content, which is important for livestock. Um, corn, high nighttime temperature, rise uh, temperature during their critical growth stage, same with the cotton. So um, if the temperature increases are happening during their critical growth stage, um, that, is, that is definitely um, going to impact on the yield. There was a modeling study uh, done recently, and this was also in the National Climate Assessment Report. This is for California. And, and again, this is not an observed study. This is just a modeling study, which looked at both low and high emission scenario impacts um, on uh, different crops. So for example, the alfalfa, there is clearly no trend, and so there is there is no projected decline in alfalfa. And, and this is true in, in many other studies. Any crop that doesn't have the reproductive stage, uh, you sort of see, you don't see a lot of significantly negative impacts. Um, and uh, in, in general, uh, for cotton, there is 29% reduction, sunflower 26%, wheat 15%, maize 12%, rice 10%, tomato 9%. So there is a decline. But one important point to, to mention here is in, in this modeling study, they did not look at the water stress. So those crops were considered fully irrigated. And uh, as we look at the future, water is going to be the biggest limiting factors. Um, and so that is going to, to have those impacts. And that I wouldn't take these numbers um, as it is because uh, this is there is inherent uncertainty, but they do respond to those declining trends. So this gives us an opportunity to to have a better management or adaptation strategies that can alleviate some of those negative impacts on yields. Um, as opposed to the previous uh, previous slide, which showed modeling impacts. This is the study done in a controlled environment and looked at the actual uh, yield decline with respect to extreme temperatures. So uh, I don't want to go into all the numbers, but if you focus on normal temperature, normal precipitation, the grain yield were around 50, 1,500 uh, grams per square meter. Under extreme temperature and less than normal precipitation, 800. So almost 40 to 50 percent decline. And, and uh, this is again in the control environment study. I believe this was in the Midwest, not here, but um, that there are very few uh, reports where they produce actual yield decline with respect to extremes. Uh, this is a report from USDA which shows economic impact on agricultural sector due to those extremes. And uh, this is all the way from 1980 to 2011. So this is not the latest one. Um, and this is, again, for the whole United States. So if you see those uh, categories for extreme, is drought, frost events, uh, flood, and uh, the heat conditions. And most of the California's impact has been in freeze risk of uh, the freeze and the drought conditions. So um, and uh, the, the biggest um, economic damage was um, 
76 billion dollars in 1988 um, in the central and eastern U.S. Uh, and so, <clears throat> if if we include recent years, uh, California's drought would make this list too. Okay, so I mentioned uh, about this chill accumulations. Uh, there were different ways in which they, they modeled this uh, chill accumulation. There is one called chill hour accumulation, but the recent <clears throat> re report says that chill portions, which is a dynamic model, they, they do work well with accumulating those uh, required chill for certain uh, fruit and nut crops. And, and this is a central valley on the horizontal scale. Um, so if you look at 1950 and 2000, uh, and these are the chill portion numbers. And if you compare it with 2040 to 2060 or 2080 to 2090, so if you compare this number with this number, uh, there is a significant decline, even in the chill portions. Um, that's, um, uh, but that doesn't mean that uh, the crops won't be sustainable. There are many adaptation measures, such as there are varieties which are uh, low chill requiring varieties. So rather than growing for high chill varieties um, in the future, there is a possibility of shifting to, to other varieties which can sustain under the warmer climate of the future. So another consequence of warmer temperature is on the <clears throat> growing season. So length of the growing season is, is typically defined as time from last spring freeze to first fall freeze. So that time frame is, is expanding. Um, and, and in California, more specifically, that, um, that number is higher than the US average. So on an average, uh, growing season is expanding by 10 to 15 days uh, for the US, whereas in California, that's anywhere from 20 to 40 days. So we are seeing more uh, frost-free season. Um, but not to confuse with the time from planting to maturity. So we recently published this paper where we <clears throat> looked at the projected changes from time to maturity for processing tomatoes in uh, five uh, Central Valley major uh, tomato producing counties. And what we found is that um, time from planting to maturity might shrink almost by 20 to 30 days. And, and uh, that can, from physiologically speaking, um, that uh, immersion to maturity time frame redu reduction is, uh, can be uh, associated with the yield declines. We haven't studied that aspect yet, but uh, we, we published this trend. Uh, in terms of impacts due to pest and diseases, so <clears throat> similar to, to crops, <clears throat> under the warmer climate conditions, uh, we are also going to see more pest and disease pressure in, in, uh, in agriculture. And uh, new pest and disease introduction or altered their growth cycle. Um, and, and that can, co if they coincide with the harvest time for agri uh, some of the major agricultural uh, regions, that can have significant impacts on, on production. In the, a few years ago, there was a particular pest which um, impacted uh, nut crops, more specifically walnut and almonds in, in the Central Valley uh, because of this pest pressure. This is just, uh, uh, this is a, one of those papers which summarizes potential impacts of uh, pest and disease uh, due to increased temperature and CO2. Um, forest fire is, is, is um, you know, we, it's not new to California. We, we, are, we have experienced uh, a lot of forest fires, um, and, and this fire risk is going to increase under the future climate. Uh, there was a paper in Science <coughs> which looked at uh, this trend, and uh, one, of the found, one of the findings was that today's fire season in the western United States starts early, lasts longer, and is more intense um, and lasts several decades. So it's more intense and it, it lasts longer and, and, and covers a lot of area too. <clears throat> and it starts, this is an indication of it starts early and this is 
um, time of snow melt and associated with the forest fire risks. Um, <clears throat> this is another uh, composite. The top figure says acre per wildfire yearly average. Uh, so per wildfire, more area is, is, is getting burnt. Uh, this is total number of areas. So if you compare the 2 million uh, in the recent years, uh, that number is more than 6 million, uh, 6 million in acres. And these are list of uh, uh, wildfires. And top 10 wildfires, um, 9 out of top 10 are since 2000. So in the recent years, um, wildfires are really getting more intense. Um, <clears throat> this is a, a good schematic that sort of provides a more comprehensive views of how climate is impacting human health. Um, and then that human health is also associated with ag productivity, ag, ag workers' health, etc. Rising temperature, um, extreme weather, sea level rise, um, um, and uh, CO2 level increase is associated with different uh, uh, complications and health issues. Developing countries are going to be more vulnerable to, to those, uh, the climate change. And uh, a warmer temperature will make disease carrying insects migrate northwards. Um, severe health impacts due to forest fires, <coughs> reduced road labor productivity, etc. Okay, so in summary, um, as we know, climate change has significantly impacted uh, different sectors. Uh, in terms of temperatures, what we saw is that both minimum and maximum, more specifically minimum temperatures have increased substantially. Uh, there is a significant uh, variability in precipitation trends. Uh, heat waves are, are getting uh, more and, and uh, spreading um, in the season. And we are also going to see uh, increased intensity and frequency of extremes, drought, flood, uh, and, and uh, extreme heat days, etc. And when we think about agricultural impacts, not just the yield, but uh, the growing season shift, water scarcity, and those issues are going to uh, challenge uh, us to, to make agriculture more innovative and be more resilient to, to future risks. And so, in order to be more systematic, and then how we um, proceed in that, so there are lots and lots of research uh, gaps that, that we need to, to fill out. Well, first thing is that we know that extreme uh, weather events are impacting agriculture, but we need better quantification of how those impacts are going to, to, to vary with respect to different parts of the California so that we can better manage and, and, and provide more systematic recommendations. Uh, we need more localized innovative research and uh, create some of those decision tools, not just looking at the scientific aspect, but we also need to look at social science aspects as well as economic, and we try to integrate those together. Um, we see a lot of modeling studies, but many times those models are not fully parameterized. So in order to use some of these models, we, we need to make sure that they are uh, better parameterized so that the results that we, give, we get from, from those uh, modeling aspects are accurate and trustworthy. Um, in terms of uh, more technical aspect, um, we need to do a better job in, in uh, improving skills of extreme precipitation forecast and how can we optimize water resources integrating those kind of uh, extreme um, uh, forecasts. Uh, and, uh, and that goes without saying that, um, uh, you know, um, we need to be innovative in terms of how we use our water. And then more specifically, um, you know, producing more food with less resources is probably the way to go for future of agriculture. And last but the most important point is um, we need to uh, engage end users or stakeholders uh, from the beginning of the process. So understand their concerns, their issues, and try to integrate when we 
develop those uh, uh, solutions for the future. With that, thank you so much. So, Taban, if you look uh, forward a few decades, there's not very much that we're going to do to change some of these trends in precipitation and temperature, et cetera. How optimistic are you that agriculture is going to respond and adapt to this new climate in California? Yeah, so um, I am optimistic because there are innovations, and, and uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, in order to to be more sustainable or resilient in the future, uh, we we need to start making those sustainable decisions now, and and even when we think about those innovations, there are certain innovations that we need to be adopting. And so, you know, the timely or informed decisions is probably the key uh, to make this, uh, you know, agriculture more, more resilient. So I am optimistic we are going to be the number one agricultural state. So that's, that's probably my hope. <laughs> and will, it, will much of the resilience be through crop selection to those parts of the so that is one aspect, um, and, and I think um, given the, the future um, and, and the amount of water that we have, I think depending on, on uh, those resources, we need to be uh, creative in terms of selecting those crops and, and not just selecting or, or shifting crops, but we also need to, to make sure that whichever crop that we do have uh, how to make them more sustainable too? Because you know, when we think about farmers, well, they cannot just shift from annual to perennial right away, and so uh, you know they have a lot of resources and things like that. So we kind of need to integrate those issues too. So if you were an actual farmer, what are three crops that you would grow? Start growing now, so you'd be in a good position by 2030 or 2040. Three crops. That's a tough question. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, so, in the, in, exactly, I, I agree, I completely agree. And, and, and uh, when we think about water, as I was talking in the, when we were having dinner, you know, water flows where the money is. And so I think it, it, it's not that, um, you know, alfalfa should be out of California because, you know, we are exporting most of the alfalfa, but I think it's because there is market for it. So in the future, when, when the water prices will go up, um, we might see those shifts, and, and depending on the market, that, that can change. So if I'm in the business, I'll look at the market. <laughs> Would you raise lots of cows? You know, they're bad for almost everything. They drink a lot of water. They uh, account for about a, a third of the greenhouse gas emissions, but it's the money crop. Yeah, and, and, and you know, that's where I think the, when we think about this innovations, so for example, um, you know, shifting alfalfa to more aquaculture or, or uh, you know, uh, moving to, to using some of the ocean resources. I know you, you're happy to hear that. <laughs> Thank you. I, I but I think... I, I was... <laughs> But you know, it, it, it's interesting because the cows with the methane, and it's mostly from burping, not coming out the after end, it's mostly burping. If you feed those cows kelp, you can reduce the amount of methane released by more than 90%. So it all comes yeah. back to aquaculture. Who has a question? Have you seen any crop migration where, you, where what they were planting in San Joaquin is further north now in the Central Valley, your um, yeah, farmers mean, doing that. And the second question is um, you talk about crop selection modification. Are you talking about genetically modified crops? Yeah, so the, for the first question, there has been some shift. So when <clears throat> there was an exceptional drought that we had, there were many areas in the Central Valley where cotton was planted, and and you know when water became limited, and and uh, I don't know what was the main reason behind it, but many of those cotton were uh, taken out and, and and planted pistachio in that area. So 
you know there is a lot of pistachio production going in that region. I do not think that is because of climate, I think it is because of the market. Um, that is the same, but when we think about uh, you know the climate, we do not see a lot of walnut production uh, further south in the valley, it is more growing up north because farmers do understand that they require higher number of chill, chill accumulations and, and uh, you get more in the north than compared to the south. So, you know sometimes climate based decisions are kind of inherent and they are not the primary decision making point for, for growers. Uh, you know we, we interviewed a lot of uh, <clears throat> almond growers in a, I had a grad student who, who interviewed all the growers in, in to, to understand uh, how they integrate climate and weather into their long term decision making process. And that is not their primary uh, point of decision making, that is just the, the market is the, uh, the main, main decision point and, and sometimes weather and climate is kind of inherent to that. Um, and your second point, a second, what was the second question, sorry I lost, lost the thought. Yeah, so yes, so that is one aspect and, and um, just varietal changes, um, that is another thing is, is um, even for let us say wine grapes, you know they are susceptible to increase in the temperature that impacts their quality, but there are more heat tolerant varieties out there. Uh, due to cultural changes they are you know they are not growing in that region that might shift in the future um, and, and same with uh, some of the perennial crops too. We have one more over here. Uh, Tapan, when you, uh, when you look at all the trends that you showed us that are fascinating and challenging looking, it is easy to think of sustainability meaning agricultural yields from California remain basically where they are today. But the UN projects we need to, to feed a growing population, we need to substantially increase global food production. So my question is what is your sense of, of whether sustainable agriculture in California means maintaining current levels or really contributing significantly to increased yields for the global population? You know the first point I want to make is um, we produce food that we should be eating and then other states are producing food that uh, uh, but I mean you know the, 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 the nuts and the more nutrition side. So when we think about food security um, there is a trade off between nutritional demand versus just the quantity. Uh, and so how we balance those I think is that's that's going to be the challenge. So I don't know the answer to that, but I think there is going to be uh, a significant challenge maintaining those nutritional values and adding more quantity in the future. But uh, you know that's an ongoing challenge I think is is every researcher is um, uh, heading towards that way. Yes. I want to thank you for your phenomenal lecture. Um, I have two um, matters of concern. Um, in terms of the optimal water storage, there are some places in the world that are actually collecting water from fog. And I want to know if you've been looking into this and the feasibility of it. Are they doing it in California? Do you think it would be helpful? And um, that's the one question I have, okay? Um, I haven't looked at the, the, the water in, in that aspect, but you know, have you heard of the um, uh, Sustainable Groundwater Management Act? Right. And so, so if that implements that, uh, that's going to uh, alleviate some of those water challenges, hopefully. Okay. <laughs> My second question is Governor Brown is considering seriously to change the time in California where we'll no longer be in spring moving forward and fall moving back an hour. Will that, because people's bodies have um, body rhythms, and I don't know if agriculture has body rhythms, will that time change affect um, the agriculture? And when you put that together with climate changes, is there any things that you can see as being problematic in resolutions? That's a tough question. <laughs> I'll, I'll have to think about it, but I think uh, what I can say is, is um, compared to other states, we are 
already ahead of the, the game in, in terms of ag innovations and implementations in California. And so I don't know how, how that plays out with the, the policy level. That's, that's, I don't know, but sorry, I, this, I, I, I have to think about this question. <laughs> Yeah. We're, we're ahead in creating innovations. Are we ahead in implementing no. those? No. Yeah. No. Yeah. And, and so that's, that's, uh, and that's why I said uh, we need to have, and then the challenge with, with you know, implementation is uh, unknown in the, the economic side. And so, you know, we need to have more holistic or comprehensive uh, look at those innovations. And, and if there is a value, yes, uh, farmers would, would, you know, ha would be happy to adopt to those technologies if we have this enough uh, certainty that um, that's the right, uh, you know, the right innovation for them. If one over there and then one down here. Uh, hi, my hi. name is Louise Fleming. I'm an active volunteer with the Sierra Club. I just have a brief announcement that might interest the the public. Um, we are sponsoring a play called Dr. Keeling's Curve um, about the um, uh, climate change and it will take place in Santa Monica September 30th and it's a fundraiser to educate the public and uh, promote uh, you know changes uh, that will adapt to climate change so if anyone's interested I have flyers I'm sorry I had to get that out Yes. And I have two questions. Number one, bees. Uh, bees are having a problem existing now, and they're declining. So in terms of agriculture, I'm just wondering, uh, and climate change, uh, uh, is, is that being addressed in the whole agricultural scenario in California? It's a significant issue. Um, and, and I think, you know, when, we, when I mentioned about the growing season shift, um, because of the less chill accumulations, because of uh, those warmer springs, the the timing of bloom is is abrupt, and and there is you know there is a the gap uh, in terms of and and so even with declining bees, there is um, the issue with the pollination because mm. of those the variations. So that's that's definitely a big challenge. And my second question is, uh, with regard to water and distribution allocation from a policy standpoint, you know, uh, now there's the dispute with the tunnels, uh, the uh, d d putting, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in, in the tunnels, and uh, we are opposed to that because we feel there are alternative ways of cons conserving and uh, reclaiming water. Um, what do you see as a solution and, you know, dealing with the reality of the um, policy makers, uh, their stance and so forth? Yeah, I, uh, you know, last week uh, we visited two irrigation districts um, uh, up in, in Northern California and one irrigation district, their distribution system was open channel and, and uh, very inefficient way of uh, water delivery, whereas the other one is is um, pretty advanced pressurized delivery systems, and and both had op, um, you know pros and cons. So you know the open channel said, well, we are happy that we kept the open channel so that we have more water seepage and then that do the groundwater recharge, whereas on the other side that meets the the demand uh, quite efficiently from from the the stakeholder side. Um, to me, I think it's the more important question uh, that we need to be addressing is how do we capture water more efficiently? So we have those variability. When we are on the, the wet side, how do we capture more efficiently so that um, we can enhance our water resources? And there are many efforts going on. And if we give an example from agricultural side, there are many places where they're trying flood irrigating fuels so that that ground uh, that recharges the the water and doesn't damage the the crops um, so that's just one example of it but i think i think uh, uh, we need to 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 have more water storage capacity in that aspect and also 
uh, ground water is our natural water storage, and so we need to enhance that aspect. Okay, we have one down here. It's a very, very impressive uh, lecture with an overwhelming amount of information that's uh, uh, hard to just digest, and I think if you were going to give a lecture about food around the world, it would last for days uh, because there's, there's all that much more information. But I was struck by one thing that you said in response to a question, and that was that the, the, the nut growers up north are making their decisions basically on economic grounds or market, or on the basis of market. Given the importance of this issue and given the complexity of this issue, do you see the need in the future for there to be different decision-making processes that take into consideration all of these things and is that practical? Very important, very important point. And I think, uh, yes, when we think about future, because this is a 30 years investment for them. So <clears throat> we need to be making more effective uh, climate communication. I think that's one aspect. I think we need to be more proactive in, in helping them uh, understand this issue. It's not, um, and then the other thing is, um, uh, making them or helping them understand, um, you know, the impacts are not 100 years down the road. It's it's, it's more uh, recent, and then that's going to impact uh, their production. However, they are, you know, when we when we think about from from growers' point of view, um, there are many large scale growers. They are willing to take those risks, and so they, you know, when you think about those trade offs they are willing to take those risks. But when we think about small growers, they are much more vulnerable uh, when, when this kind of events happen. So, you know, if, um, and, and the complexity of this issue is, so for example, when we uh, recommend that, okay, well, go for, uh, you know, low-chill varieties, what happens is that when they go for low-chill varieties, they bloom early. And if then the frost event occurs afterwards, that damages their crop. And so, they lose their, um, you know, the trust in this kind of. So there is uncertainty, and then so uh, we need to better communicate those uncertainties too. Uh, I think that's probably. I think it's clear that we need better decision making tools and processes. They not only have to involve the stakeholders, but they have to involve the experts like Tapan, who so you can lay out the facts. And often I think that's not something we do very well. We have one in the back and then one, one here, and that'll be, a, wait, it'll be our last one. Go ahead. All right. I'm, I'm glad the gentleman asked the question because Put my the microphone was just, closer to your mouth. Uh, just the follow up to that. You're with Cooperative Extension, so you talk to farmers all the time. Yeah. What's their attitude towards your research information on climate change? They, they are not opposed to it. Uh, from, from, from growers' point of view, I think, um, if they see a value or if they see a practical um, benefit from their farm, they are willing to accept those recommendations. But as I said, I think many of those recommendations that we have, um, that do come with those uncertainties. So sometimes it's challenging, even from our point of view, it's challenging to, to communicate those uncertainties well. Um, and so, you know, they do understand there is a risk. Um, and, and, and I think it's, it's probably, you know, we need to do an even better job of communicating, you know, um, there is at least 10% chance with, with your crop being hit by frost, but there is, you know, 90% of the time that, that can't happen and then you might sustain your crop or, or yield in that way. Uh, so, so, you know, I think I, think I would say it's, it's better communication um, uh, is, is probably the key in this aspect. And, but they do get this the long-term trend, and they do understand this uh, climate change um, uh, is happening, it's, and, and it's, it's impacting their crops. When you have your grad students talking to the growers, do they ask them if they believe that the climate change impacts are embedded in their price expectations about the future when they're thinking about what crop to, hmm. to plant? We, I haven't asked this question to the growers, um, especially from, from their um, uh, marketing decision point. I think, but, you know, we are doing another set of uh, 
uh, interviews, and I think this is a good question. I, I think, uh, um, I mean, it's to a certain extent, we, we know that, um, that's, but I don't know if they, they sort of fully embed it uh, in, the, in the risk assessment aspect or not, but I think it's, it's probably a good question to ask them. This is really a very important issue. It's one that uh, we feel strongly enough that in the fall, we're going to give a short course through our aquatic academy. There will be four two, hour, two and a half hour evening sessions. And the, the topic is how will we feed an additional two to two and a half billion people? And uh, Tapan will be one of the people lecturing. We're going to have one evening devoted to genetic engineering and CRISPR. We're going to have one evening devoted to aquaculture. Um, and we have the former Secretary of Agriculture who's going to be a speaker. It really will be quite a remarkable lineup because the UN says we need to have 70% more food by 2050. And the, the predictions are that with climate change, while there will be winners and losers, globally we will lose 15 to 30% of our overall productivity. Now, innovations can offset set some of that, obviously. But even today, with 7.6 billion people, we have lots of people who are undernourished, and we have more people who are malnourished. So the question is, how do we feed the future? Mm -hmm. So we hope that you'll come. And if, by the way, if you haven't seen Dr. Keeling's Curve, it's a wonderful play. We, we had it here in Long Beach a few years ago. It's worth, it's worth going to. Thank you all for coming. Next lecture is 31 July. Mike Bartek, who's a diver, he dives at night in the Philippines. And um, 7 o'clock on the 31st, thank you all for coming. Thank you.